Something else I did here is I used what I would call the one atom at a time technique. I, knew, I drew the new product one atom at a time. First the iodine, then the carbons, then the hydrogen, then the bromine. What a lot of students try to do is they try to draw the product in one fell swoop. But then they tend to make mistakes and break bonds they're not supposed to. So I would recommend just going one atom at a time. Okay, well let's try to use those same principles to draw what the product would be from this reaction. Let's work this out on paper. Well, I'm glad that you're thinking about that. That's a big step right there, that you're thinking about that. Now, one thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to number this molecule. Anytime you have multiple carbons, it's a good idea to use numbers to keep track of the carbons. OK, and now we can go one atom at a time. Well, we can keep these. Now, does this arrow indicate that we're forming a bond or breaking a bond or both? Bond. Yeah, between which two atoms? Good, so I'll put that in. This is one reason why it's good to number. So we can say exactly between which two atoms we're forming the bond. Okay, and this is still bonded to the hydrogens. Remember that we don't want to break any bonds unless an arrow specifically tells us to break that bond. Okay, and then the thing that was really good is that you stopped to think about the charges. Um, now remember that once we understand the arrows, there should be no guesswork. The arrows should tell us exactly which charges to change. How many charges are we going to change? two charges at the initial tail and at the final head. We're always going to change two charges at the initial tail and the final head. Well, which atom here is at the initial tail? Uh, oxygen. That's right. Okay. Um, well, what would his charge be? It's um, neutral right now. Started neutral. Good. Yeah. And then I think it becomes positive because it, the electrons go into the bond. Yeah. Okay, that was right. Um, you didn't sound too confident about that, but that's exactly right. That's the exact right logic. Um, so this is starting neutral, and we're losing electrons. Well, then we should become one step more positive, just like you worked that out. So basically, anything that is at the initial tail always will become one step more positive. You don't need to actually work out exactly where these electrons are going. The key thing is that they're just going somewhere. Now, some students might be confused because the oxygen is still going to be sharing the electrons. The electrons have gone from the, uh, a lone pair into this bond. But the point is that you have less electrons around you when you're sharing a pair than when you own them as a lone pair. But we don't, we don't even have to think about that so much. Whoever is at the initial tail will always become one step more positive. No exceptions. Now, which is the atom that was at the final head? The carbon. Carbon two. Yeah. yeah. So what would its new charge be? Because it started positive, and it's gaining electrons. Whoever is at the, in, uh, the final head will always become one step less positive, or one step more negative, no exceptions. So we don't even have to work that out. So this must now be neutral. And do the net charges still balance? Well, yes, there was a plus one charge here and a plus one charge here. OK, so it's good that you were thinking about the charges. Um, Sounds seemed like you weren't quite uh, sure about that, but you worked that out correctly. Those are the right charges. Many, many students forget to put in this charge, so it's good that you were thinking about that. In this case, it's obvious who the initial tail and the final head are, because I only put in one arrow. All right. Um, by the way, uh, we won't worry about stereochemistry here, so um, uh, the arrows don't tell you the stereochemistry. Um, they just tell you who's connected to who. Okay. 
Good. By the way, um, remember I said that we don't usually draw lone pairs. So why did I draw this lone pair? Well, this is the one exception. Um, the convention is that you cannot have a tail that's just pointing at an atom. You can't just have a tail pointing at an atom. If this had a negative charge, we could put the tail on the negative charge, but it doesn't have a negative charge. So if you've got no negative charge and you're donating a lone pair, that's the one time that we do draw the lone pair just as a convention. Um, this still has another lone pair, but I'm not going to draw that in because there's no reason to. drawing the product here. Okay, well, tell me when you think you're finished. Um, I think you're finished. Okay. One technique that we should use here is numbering again. Anytime we have multiple carbons, it's a good idea to number. So let's put in some uh, numbers like this. Of course, these are not. I'm oh, sorry. talk about that a little. The key thing to realize is that your instructor thinks that this is super easy. So we have to get to the point where it's super easy for us too. Um, now the key thing is to trust the arrows and use uh, go one atom at a time. So here's what I mean by going one atom at a time. Who should the number one atom be attached to? Two. Who should the number two be attached to? Three. Who should the three be attached to? N. All right. Who should the, the nitrogen be attached to? H and four and seven. It's attached to the H, because that bond's not breaking. It's attached to the four. And this tells us that we're forming a new bond between the nitrogen and the seven. This is what I think you left out of your first picture. In the original picture, you haven't formed this bond. Well, how could you have avoided that mistake? Well, maybe if you go one atom at a time and specifically ask yourself, what is everything that this is attached to? Well, and ask yourself, what is the arrow telling me? Well, this arrow is telling me to form a bond between the nitrogen and the number seven. Okay, uh, eventually you caught that mistake. Uh, and then I think you saw that then you made a, a short-lived other mistake because then, at first, you only put one carbon attached to the nitrogen. And only later did you realize there should be something else. And what was it that forced you to see your mistake? The numbers. So I really want to emphasize, again, um, unfortunately, most students are lazy and they don't put in numbers ever. 
Um, well, instead, we should put numbers on almost every problem that there's multiple carbons, unless the problem is really easy. Because one of the biggest mistakes students make is they accidentally add or drop carbons. Again, originally, you had accidentally dropped a carbon here, um, and it was not obvious because we didn't have any of these numbers. For some reason, bond line notation makes it very easy to lose track of how many carbons you have. But once you started putting in numbers, you said, well, wait a second, what happened to number six? So numbering really, um, it really prevents you from kind of losing senseless points. It's unfortunate that so many students lose points because of adding or dropping carbons on the exams. If they just numbered their pictures, then they wouldn't be adding or dropping carbons. So unless the problem is really easy, I recommend putting in numbers. Obviously, these are not IUPAC numbers. We're not trying to give IUPAC names. These are just reference numbers. So you can use any numbers you want as long as you're consistent in the different pictures. Notice that it would not have done you much good to number these if you didn't try to number the product as well, because it's when you numbered the product that you realize that you've left out a carbon. 